Hello everyone, um, welcome to our talk um, on using the awesome framework to develop an OpenStreetMap confidence index to support humanitarian mapping. Um, I'm Benjamin, working in Heidelberg at HiGit, and this presentation I will give together with Hannah from MapAction. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm working as a data scientist with MapAction. Nice. Yeah, and let's directly uh, jump into what we've prepared for today. So we are going to speak about OpenStreetMap and map data and humanitarian mapping. And Hannah will start with yeah, why this matters for map action. Hey, thank you. So I'll maybe start just before digging into what's on the slide here with a quick kind of overview of map action for those who might not be aware and kind of the background context of what we do. Um, so we're a humanitarian mapping charity based out of the UK. Um, mostly a volunteer-based community supported by a small staff team. Uh, and we, most of our work involves um, deploying teams to crisis-affected areas uh, where we provide technical geospatial expertise to our field partners. Um, and so I think unsurprisingly, given our name, we create a lot of maps uh, and we'll talk through some of those in this presentation today. Um, and kind of coming back to data quality, uh, data quality is something that matters, something that matters a lot to us throughout all of the mapping uh, work that we do since data is really at the heart. Um, and OSM specifically because it's a data source that we use frequently in all of our mapping kind of around the world. So for us, this work is really about being able to make statements about whether or not um, map data from OSM is good enough for the needs that we have and the products that we're trying to create in a crisis response. Um, we're also looking to support uh, kind of more systematic approaches for evaluating data quality since, you know, while data quality is something that we think about all the time um, and our teams think about all the time and are experienced in, it's not necessarily something that we have a systematic process for evaluating and for dealing with and for making decisions based on. And kind of along these lines, we also want to formalize the knowledge and the data quality needs that we have. Um, and as I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, you know, so when we have a number of standard products or map products that we would create, uh, we're trying to kind of pull out the requirements of those products and translate those into explicit data quality needs based on their intended use cases. Um, and this work is also really about informing data preparedness. Um, if we're able to, as we will discuss later in the presentation, kind of outline these data quality needs, evaluate OSM based on these needs uh, kind of proactively before we're actually actively engaged in a response, this might be able to help inform uh, where more data collection and processing efforts should be invested. So, I think to be very specific about it, the question that we have on the right side of the slide here is the kind of question that we're looking to answer with this work. So we're asking things like how suitable is the settlements layer from OSM for creating a country, uh, a Haiti country overview map, for example. And on this next slide, uh, I'll just kind of demonstrate an example of what I mean by a map action product um, in this case, a country overview map, which in this work we've kind of been taking is our initial proof of concept um, and exploring data quality through this simple product that we um, will kind of create in most of the response work that we do. So um, it might be somewhat self-explanatory from the title, but country overview map that we create really just provides a simple overview and orientation of a country or or geographic area that we're interested in. And so we'll include things like, as you can see on this map of Sri Lanka, um, the capital city, other key cities, major components of the transportation network, like major roads and rail lines, um, and basic physical topography and features like rivers and lakes. And this product is really intended for kind of new responders coming into a country that might perhaps be unfamiliar to them um, and need to be oriented uh, and familiarized with 
kind of the overall geography of an affected area. And this is also something that we really try to keep as simple as possible because we want to communicate key geographic features um, and not to kind of overcomplicate the map or I say map and product kind of interchangeably here. We're thinking about them as products, but many, most of these products are maps. Um, I mean, when we break it down, kind of as I've mentioned, we have a number of ingredients or components that go into this, many of which will come from OpenStreetMap frequently, such as a layer of the national capital, major cities, um, transportation, and elements of physical geography. So this next slide, I'll just kind of give an overview of, from our perspective and from kind of our use cases, how we're trying to go about uh, and kind of operationalize and implement um, data quality evaluation. And so we're trying to think about this framework kind of from the perspective of a product and trying to be really aware of, you know, how data quality is incredibly dependent on the use case for the data and an application for the data. So starting with a product, for example, as I spoke about a country overview map, we are working to kind of concretely define what that product is and what we want it to be used for. Um, we then work to break that product down into all of its component layers. So as I mentioned, this might be a number of different data layers from OpenStreetMap representing different, different features in different geographic elements like roads, rivers, and lakes. Uh, and then for each of these layers, we then want to go and break them down in terms of the requirements that we have for those layers and the data quality considerations that we have. So for example, um, we would want the, the settlement locations to correspond with population density. We would want the road network to be um, topologically accurate and a fully connected network. Um, and then once we have these requirements from our layers, which are from our product, we want to kind of go about evaluating them and actually investigate data quality and bring this into kind of a final report that will present data quality information um, and help us make decisions about, for example, whether or not OSM is appropriate for the use case that we have whether we need to look to other data sources, whether we might need to advocate for further data collection, um, or you know, whether the data is appropriate for us to use. Um, so on the next slide, this spreadsheet is just kind of an example of, of what I was talking about in a more practical way here. So um, some work that we're doing now is just this one, this spreadsheet corresponds to, again, the country overview product. And you can see kind of on the leftmost column, we have uh, lists of layers that would go into this product. Each of those would have a corresponding source. We have some information here about how to actually filter those within OSM. Um, and then kind of the quality dimensions for those layers that we care about. So for example, we have a major settlements layer on the top here and we're interested in things like attribute completeness, um, logical consistency, geographic completeness, uh, timeliness. Um, and each of these have kind of an associated requirement that you see in the next column, and then would have an indicator that we could use to go about evaluating that requirement. Um, and so I think I'll turn it back to Benny here to get into some of the technical details of this and how their team's going about uh, kind of putting this in practice and creating tools uh, that can help us create some of these indicators and actually evaluate the, the data in OSM. Yeah, thanks, Hannah, for that, that good context and introduction to, to yeah, why this matters. And yeah, this is basically what Hannah presented kind of has happened in the past months in the communication many discussion rounds between people at Highgate, where I work, and people at Map Action, where Hannah works, where, where we kind of try to find out all those different components that make up data quality. And what came out of this as, as a first tool is the awesome quality analyst. 
and it takes up all those ideas that we've heard now and puts it into yeah, a technical framework, so to say, um, where we can have such customizable reports that fit the different data quality needs for specific products. And those reports, they combine these individual data quality dimensions, which we call here data quality indicators. So for each um, quality dimension, we can have an indicator such as for completeness, or currentness and, and many others. And this is put together in yeah, several like tools in a way that on the one hand we have a web application where one could just click and select areas and report to, to retrieve um, existing reports or results. But on the other hand, it's also a command line tool that allows researchers or like people that, that want to use the tool to calculate data quality indicators or reports for their own custom regions on their own local machines. And all this is also available um, open source on GitHub, so you are invited also to take a look at the repository that I've linked here, and we will have the link later again, um, and also yeah, contribute there or help us to, to, to cover the right data quality needs or dimensions that, that actually matter. So I would like now to, to just highlight a few of the indicators that we have implemented and want to show um, as yeah, ex exemplary, like for Haiti, how the results can look like. So for instance, we've heard already that completeness of the road network can be an in interesting and important indicator of OSM data quality. Basically, you need to know where you can trust the road network or not. And because OSM can be very heterogeneous in its completeness, we, we implemented this indicator that compares the length of the road network and OpenStreetMap to the population density and kind of use this as an estimation of completeness of the road network. And you see in case here that the road network for Haiti is rather complete in many areas of Haiti, but still there are a few areas for instance, here up in the north, where there are bigger chunks or like bigger areas where we think the road network might not be fully complete. And so this, in, in the other way, can also mean that in those areas more mapping is needed. And you can also see, as given here on the right-hand side, that sometimes those areas can also be yeah, closely, uh, close to each other. Um, so all this really gets then down to, to the yeah, dynamics and characteristics of OSM mapping happens, right? Um, so another example is basically the same approach here, comparing population density to the feature density in OpenStreetMap. This time we did it for the number of buildings. That's also an important information if, if you look, yeah, want to create maps, probably also if you want to go a bit uh, deeper and zoom in a bit more. And on the first um, glance, what we can directly see for, for this case of Haiti is that the road network seems to be much more complete than the number of, of the building mapping. So here, basically, there are only a very few areas where more or less all buildings have been mapped. And in most areas, we estimate that there's still a lack of buildings. And this kind of information here, again, um, can then help to, to drive more mapping activity or also can, can mean that other data sources should be taken into account. Um, you might see here at the bottom also, so how we do this is based on threshold functions and we are constantly trying to improve those and make them also a bit more geography aware so that you can have like different thresholds for different regions because that relationship between population density and building density obviously is not always the same or in all places the same, right? Okay, going beyond completeness, completeness might be one of the first quality dimensions that one is interested in, but also completeness is only good in a way to say if the data is also up to date. And this is what currentness is, is about. So here we check how much of the data that we find in OSM has been edited 
over the past year or even going more in the, in the past. So this can tell us really is there a community behind this data that keeps the data also up to date. Um, also in Haiti's case here, we would say, yeah, we need, would, would need to evaluate this a bit more because at least some parts or larger parts of, of, of the data in OSM here seem to be updated only yeah, a longer time ago. So one would need additional checks to make sure that this data still is kind of what you would like to use. Um, so the temporal accuracy here is always um, another important step. And the last example that I wanted to highlight is attribute completeness. So the first completeness I'm, uh, I showed was more the geometry completeness. So are uh, like the roads being mapped. Here we have an example for attribute completeness where we looked at bridges and tried to find out if the bridges that we find in OSM actually have the attributes that we would expect. So in this case here, we, we checked the bridges should have a surface, surface tag and a name. So, and here that's all also just an example, but you can see that like, if we do something like this, we could use an indicator also for schools, for hospitals, to, to get like much more or much deeper into the richness that OSM might have or might not have. And this then also relates back to, to what Hanna presented in the beginning, how the products are actually defined. Because each map product might require a different level of detail, and this might not only be about what features to, to display, but also of what additional attributes to consider in creating such a map. And this is what this attribute completeness indicator tries to tackle. Um, and as mentioned in the beginning, so indicators are like the small component and then we can basically put together indicators in a way how we want it and can also weight different indicators and then together they will form a report. Right? So this is like the whole idea behind the awesome quality analyst. And now I would just want to, to do maybe two steps back again um, and want to highlight a bit more what is actually behind um, yeah, OQT um, from the more technical perspective. So something that we call the awesome tool stack. Um, awesome stands for the open history um, database, it's, or it's underlying is the open street map history database. It's a yeah, spatial temporal database system that um, holds the entire history of open street map and makes it available for such analysis as we would like to do it. On top of that, uh, we created the awesome API, so that's like the user-friendly, easy interface um, to, to do those uh, queries. You could, could also directly uh, query the OSHDB, but here in this case, we, we go through the awesome API. And on top of this, there are several tools, and OQT is only one of them. There are also other ones, like the awesome dashboard that I will show uh, briefly, and awesome hacks um, as like a global cache or spatial temporal database system to process, visualize OpenStreetMap related statistics. Um, and those tools then can be put into use for several kind of um, yeah, topics. And here we focused a bit more on the humanitarian mapping use case, but similar questions could also arise from, from topics like traffic or traffic planning, climate, climate change, healthcare planning, Right, so um, there would be many different options how we could apply this. Um, yeah, you can also find most of these tools on GitHub. Um, and I would like to show just briefly the awesome dashboard because that's really a super nice and easy entry point into, into our awesome tool stack, so to say. Um, just follow the link and this allows you to um, get statistics or information about OSM mapping in particular countries or regions relatively easily and super, in a super flexible manner. So you can decide what kind of objects or features in OSM you would like to get information about, just put it in there, um, add some more uh, parameters, and you could get easily some plots like we have here on the left-hand side that show the evolution of the road network here, only the primary roads in, in Nepal um, over the past 
decade or even longer. Um, so for the ones of you that have not um, looked so much into the OSM history, I, th I would really recommend to take a look at this tool because it makes it super easy. And some of you, I don't know, might remember a few years ago, we also had another talk at Phos4G about the awesome API already. So um, this might also be an opportunity to re-watch that video from, I don't know, two or three years ago. Um, and the last example that I wanted to show is, is awesome hacks. That's kind of our space-time cube, so spatial temporal database system that also uses information from the OSHDB and puts this into Postgres tables for several um, resolutions of so-called like hex hexagon grid. And so we use like several spatial resolutions and that sums up to many different um, polygons and <laughs> many different timestamp and values. Um, so this really covers then the global level for uh, particular statistics that we picked. And um, yeah, also feel free to explore this. There's, there's super much in it. Um, and also we are planning to, to put back the results from the quality also back into the awesome hacks to make it available to a larger scale. Yeah, I think it's time maybe for us to think about um, challenges and what next. Maybe Hannah can give it a start first again. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So maybe just stepping back again briefly from and speaking from the perspective of kind of the data, the data users, um, people who are looking to create or as map action looking to create meaningful um, and accurate products out of OSM data. Um, for us, uh, you know, one of the big challenges that's come out of the work that I was describing earlier is just um, it's challenging to ask people about data quality needs. And you know, when for each of the products, we're trying to kind of get the set of requirements that we have and translate those into indicators that are meaningful. Um, a lot of this is kind of asking people about what they want out of a map product and what they want out of the data in it. Um, and I think data quality can be challenging in that you know, sometimes it's easy to, to pinpoint when something's wrong, but it's more challenging to say, you no, know, this is exactly what we want, this is what this is what is right, it's kind of hard to pin down as something that is not so much a technical problem, um, but nonetheless very challenging in this work. Uh, and I think then from a more technical perspective, what we're looking to do with this moving forward um, is integrate this kind of data quality evaluation into the automated mapping pipelines that we're creating. So to have kind of two components to this where we can present information about data quality in a human readable way and enable some of our volunteer teams to um, use that to investigate OSM data and kind of gain a greater intuition about the quality of that data. But we would also like to kind of further down the line, integrate some of this information in a, a more quantitative and empirical way, and perhaps use that in our automated pipelines um, to aid with decision-making a little bit and perhaps raising um, kind of throughout the the automated process, perhaps, you know, raising a quality flag at certain points if a given threshold is met or not, or being able to, in an automated or semi-automated way, make decisions about which data set may or may not be more appropriate for, for a given product. Because sometimes we do, you know, end up with multiple data sets for the same features such as admin boundaries and struggle with trying to compare them and figure out which one we should use. Um, and then as I was speaking to just how we can present, present results of a quality evaluation in a meaningful way uh, for, uh, for the, the volunteers and the people who we have who are creating our maps um, and how can this uh, inform decision making, which is, kind of in the long run, what we're interested in aiming in this and what at what what kind of granularity of information is useful, how much detail should we present to people um, and what to do people who are making our maps really want to know. Um, Benny, I'll let you speak to perhaps some of the technical challenges uh, that your team has as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, really, really good points already. So also for us, from that sometimes we might come more from the technical or more research-oriented perspective, like finding out what data quality is is on one hand, of course, a research topic, but also like yeah, we need to understand the, the users kind of what they understand as data quality. So that's super important. And now when it comes to the maybe technical issues um, or issues or challenges, maybe so. We would like to scale this to the global scale as we did with some other indicators that might not be quality indicators but more general statistics for OSM and we have them in awesome hacks already. So this is something we really aim for but um, we also further need to further explore how, how this can happen. And maybe, maybe a side note here, this is not only a technical issue per se but also it is it comes down to, to how we actually define data quality. So it's also a conceptual problem somehow, in a way that data quality or some of the data quality indicators, might, we might not be able to define them the same way in all the places. So as yeah, we have learned about the needs and requirements from, 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 from map action or other organizations, I think the easier or the better we will be able to do this. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's much more to say, Hannah, from your side. Other than that, I think we would be at the end of the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Cool. Yeah, so that's us. Um, contact us if you have any further questions. And we've also put a list of resources and links here on, on the last slide. So feel free to, to explore these and reach out, out to us whenever you have some, some questions. And um, thanks for listening and yeah, have a nice day. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. Um, we've got Benjamin here for his Q&A session. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just head on into it. Um, the first question is, the awesome quality analyst is open source, but is the whole awesome stack too? Hey, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Can you hear me well? Yep. Perfect. So I would say 90% of this is also open available on GitHub. So the OpenStreetMap history database, OSHDB you will find there. The awesome API you will find there as well. The only tool that we might not have there at the moment is awesome hacks, but like some libraries are. So most of the things you will be able to find on GitHub. And if, if not, like always feel free to contact us and we can try to share code for sure. Oh, perfect. Um, okay, there's actually a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> um, the next question is, have you made any comparisons of geographic completeness to a reference data set? Um, so far, we haven't. Um, so we have, it's always different. What is what is a good reference data set for OpenStreetMap as you yeah, can't really find this on the global scale. But for a few countries, you can for sure. And there has been research work around this. And this is something we are, yeah, we want to do now as a next step as we did more or less this proof of concept for the indicators to compare the results for different countries where we have a reference data set. So for instance, for the UK, or there are many other countries, but there would be some easy countries to go where we know that there's open data available to, to compare ours and against. Yeah. And maybe I'll just choose a random one since we're running a bit out of time. Um, the first one, are you considering to expand the scope of completeness or currentness to local knowledge features such as as points of interest, land use types using OSM tags, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also an interesting question. So what I've or what we've presented is has have been some examples, and so we would really like to expand this. But from from my perspective, more from the research side, it's sometimes really difficult to decide which is the next thing we want to do. So this is mainly where the the users of the data would come into play. So if if there are people out there that need some really specific things like I need to know the tag completeness, attribute completeness of POIs. That's mm -hmm. great because then write us an email and this is what we want to work on. It's like 
for us, just defining it from from scratch is super difficult. So it, it's much more fun and way better if we can give, do it the other way around. Like let the people tell us what they what want. They right. Yeah, that's a good approach. Well, thank you so much, Benjamin, for um, your presentation today. Um, and I hope you have a good FOSS for G experience. Um, and I guess if anybody has any questions, they can contact you. Yes, for um, sure. And we'll see you in the next, I don't know, <laughs> next <laughs> conference, maybe. Yeah, no, right, so far the experience is really great. Great. We'll see you later. Thank you. OK, bye. Bye. So we're going to move straight into our next presentation as well. Um, this is a joint presentation by Amit and Eric, uh, titled Delivering Open Source Solutions to Humanitarian Organizations and Governments in Low Resource Settings to Plan for, Monitor, and Respond to Climate-Driven Disasters. Amit's career has included 10 plus years in the World Food Program's Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Team, or VAM, which is now a division at WFP called Research Assessments and Monitoring, now called RAM. <laughs> Along with several years of software development and enterprise technology deployments in the private sector. Eric, on the other hand, has a desire to code for Eric, on the other hand, has a desire to code for good.